morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, verses 24 through 28. Hear now God's word. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God the word of God for the people of God. Amen. This morning, we are in week eight of a nine-week sermon series entitled Summer of the Staycation. And today's staycation is a little different from the other ones, and basically what we're doing is looking at how just in our vicinity, our, our community and the surrounding community we're looking at how we don't have to go far to see the wonder and the, the work and the beauty of God. We can see it in our community. We can see it in a, in a short drive, a staycation. Well, today's staycation is a little different than the rest of the ones we've looked at because really this is not a staycation in and of itself. This is not something you necessarily want to go and do and that's all you do. This might be something you want to do as you're going to Chicago or maybe the outdoor mall in Michigan City. The place that I'll be talking about, you can't even go inside. It's fenced off. You only can see it from the road. But I really wanted to talk about it this morning. And so it's our staycation. So again, if maybe you're going to Chicago, maybe you want to take a little detour, preferably during the day, to Gary, <laughs> Indiana, to see, just from the road, City Methodist Church, once the largest church in the Midwest. It was built in the 1920s. At its height, it had 3,000 members. It was actually my father's home church when he was in high school. When he was in high school, the weekly average attendance was about 1,700 people. A nine-story complex, not only with a huge sanctuary, but a theater. And you can leave it on this slide right here, but that's how it was, you know, in the early 1900s. But it not only had a, a big sanctuary, it had a theater that could seat 1,000 people. There were bowling alleys in this church. So a Sunday school complex, a cafeteria, a gymnasium. In today's dollars, it would cost about $8 million to build this church. A city Methodist church in Gary, Indiana. Once the largest church in the Midwest. But again, this is Gary, Indiana, right? In the 1970s, the steel industry collapsed. People moved out of Gary. The church membership declined. And in 1975, it, it closed its doors. Here's one more picture of how it used to be, of the sanctuary filled with people. Gothic architecture, beautiful architecture. Here are four slides of how it is today. Literally, it is in ruins. There was an arson fire then left to nature, and there wasn't enough money to, to rescue the church. I mean, the money involved would be astronomical to, to make it a church again. Here's another picture from the outside. Again, a, a church in ruins. Now, these, the, even in these ruins, there's beautiful architecture, and there used to be people, urban explorers, who would love to go into the church, and they would explore the church even as it was in ruins, but even then the city said, you know, this is not safe any longer, and so they put a fence around the church. Another picture of City Methodist Church. This is actually the, the uh, theater 
that could seat a uh, thousand people. Now, in its, its, in its ruins, there have been some movies with this church in the movie. Um, for instance, A Nightmare on Elm Street. I won't ask who has seen A Nightmare on Elm Street. Not necessarily one of my favorite. It was also in uh, Transformers, Dark of the Moon. Scenes from Pearl Harbor, which I just saw this weekend, coincidentally. Some scenes pictured in this movie. But it was fenced up in, in 1999. I think we have one more picture of City Methodist Church, of how it is today. Literally, trees are, are growing up inside of City Methodist Church. A once great church, now literally in ruins. They do have plans, though. There is hope. Not for it to become another church. Again, that would just cost too much money. But the idea is to make it a ruins garden. And that's the, that's the phrase they, they use. A ruins garden. Has anybody heard of a ruins garden? Basically, what they take are traditionally historic sites, historic buildings. They remove all of the unstable rubble. They clear out all the, the trash. And what's left, they stabilize it. They keep a lot of the, the architecture, the architectural salvage, and they make a garden out of it. Here's one example of a ruins garden. You see the, the architecture in the, in the back, they've, they've made that stable. They've removed all the unstable material, but you do have salvage left. And so you see the, the past remains of a beautiful structure, but they've made it into a, a beautiful garden. Here's a, a photo of what City Methodist Church could be like in the future. A grant has been given to explore this possibility. Obviously, plans have been drawn up. But I love this idea. I love this idea of a ruins garden. You know, in it, the past remains. Part of the past remains. Part of the ruins remain. And yes, it, you can still see the scars and the pits and the difficult times in the architecture. But what they do is make it complete. So now that it is something beautiful, it is something that brings forth life, this idea of a, of a ruins garden. Making something beautiful out of the ruins. Making something complete out of something that was destroyed. I just love that idea, a ruins garden. You know, in our scripture lesson this morning from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, it is the ruined flesh of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that brings us hope. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but, you know, this is Jesus' resurrected body in John 20. This is his forever body, right? This is his forever body, yet it has the scars. The scars remain. And I don't know if you've ever thought about your forever body, but I was kind of hoping in my resurrected body I'd lose all my scars. And I've got a lot of scars. I've got hip replacement scars. I've got, you know, acne scars from my youth. I've got barbed wire scars. I'm not going to go into that story. But don't try to climb over a barbed wire fence. It never ends well. But I've got a lot of scars, and I was kind of hoping with my resurrected body, with my forever body, I'd kind of get away. I'd get rid of those scars. And maybe my resur resurrected body will get rid of those scars. Maybe, maybe I won't have them. Because I think Jesus, in one way or another, I think Jesus chose to keep his scars. He chose to keep the ruined flesh of the crucifixion. Because it's in the scars, it's in the ruined flesh that we are reminded of how much we are loved by our Heavenly Father. It's in the scars that we have signs of Jesus' victory. It's in the ruined scars that we are made complete. It's in the ruined scars 
that we are reminded time and time again that in the eyes of God, we were worthy of every pain and we were worthy of every piercing. That ruined flesh are eternal reminders of what Jesus Christ has done for you and of what Jesus Christ has done for me. In Isaiah 53, 5, the prophet tells us, he was pierced for our transgressions and by his wounds we are healed. By his wounds you are healed. By his wounds I am healed. And I, I am sure we, we have people here this morning sitting in these pews and you are going through your own time of pain. You're going through your own time of discouragement. You're going through your own valley. Maybe you are in your own ruins. And if so, I just want to encourage you in your mind's eye to witness, to see the scars, the ruined flesh of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Look at his hands. Look at his feet. Look at the side that was pierced for you, the side that was pierced for, you, for me. For in those scars, those scars are shouts of victory. Those scars are symbols of triumph. Those scars are statements of God's unending love for us. They are proof that we can be healed. And we find them in the scars. We find them in the ruined flesh of Jesus. Put your finger here, says Jesus. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put into my side. Stop doubting and believe. You see, Jesus kept his scars for you. Jesus kept his scars for me so that when we doubt, when we are hurting, when we are in pain, we can look at the scars and remember that regardless of what we go through, Jesus has already been through it and Jesus has been victorious. And because Jesus has won, we too can win through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the victory of Jesus Christ, through his scars, through his ruined flesh, we have been given the victory. In Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16, the author tells us, now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest with ready access to God. Let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. We don't have a, a high priest who hasn't been through what we've been through. He's been through every weakness. He's been through every testing that we have. He has experienced it all all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy. Accept the help. Take the mercy. Accept the help. I know some of you here this morning, you feel unworthy. I know some of you, you feel unloved because you've been let down, because you have been betrayed. Again, I want to encourage you, look at the scars, look at the ruined flesh, look at those signs of victory that God has given to us through His Son. That God sees the ruins, and God wants to make something beautiful. This week I, I came across a, a quote by uh, Eric Little, which is kind of interesting because it's the second time this month I've come across that name. The first time was at our Core Values workshop a few weeks ago. Are you, are you familiar with Eric Little? If you're at the workshop, you should know who Eric Little is. 
He, he, he's the, the Olympic athlete who uh, Chariots of Fire was based on. In 1924, because of his faith, he refused to run on, 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 a, on a Sunday. And at those Olympics, his, his best event, the 100 meters, was being held on a Sunday. And he refused to run it because of his faith. Because of the Christian Sabbath. And he saw running as his profession. And so he declined to run the race. Eric Little, from Scotland. So what he did was run the 400 meters, which was held on a weekday. He not only won it, but he won the, uh, not, not only won the gold, but he set a world record. He set a, an Olympic record. Just an amazing, amazing achievement. And that's what most people know him for. But you know, it does take guts to refuse, you know, to run an Olympic event because of your faith. And I don't know if I would have done that had, had that faith to say, you know what, I know I've trained all my life for this. I know I'm the best at this event. I'm here at the Olympics, but I'm not going to run. I mean, it took a lot of guts, right? But in the end, he still ran another race. He still won a gold medal. And it's unfortunate that we know Eric Little more for that than what he did after that. He won that gold medal in 1924. Yet in 1925, he gave, all, he gave up the fame, the fortune of, of being an Olympic gold medalist. He gave it all up to go and to be a full-time missionary in China. Where many times, he did not know where his next meal was going to come from where he was overworked, where he suffered a, um, a nervous breakdown. He had a hard time in China. In 1943, when the Japanese came into to China and attacked and was trying to take over, he was actually put into an internment camp, Eric Little was. And the people who were there with him said he was just amazing, even, even though he was malnourished, even though he was overworked, even though he was dealing, um, he was even diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. I mean, he had all this stuff going on in his life. Yet even then, people say, who were around him, they'll, they'll say, you know, he, he was the brightest light that we saw in that place. He was always jovial. He always had a smile on his face. He was always there to help you out, regardless of what he was facing. He died five months before they were released from that internment. Yet this week, what, what I came across was, was a quote of, of Eric Little's. And this is what he said. Circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plan. But God is not helpless among the ruins. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. You see, our ruins do not come as a surprise to God. God knows full well what is on our horizon. And if God allows the ruins to come into your life, you better believe that God is also planning to make them beautiful. And not only is God planning to make them beautiful, but God is planning to use you to be the living scars of His Son, Jesus Christ, so that you can go out and tell your story. You know, so often we want to hide our scars. We don't want to tell people about our scars, whether they're physical or mental or emotional or spiritual. We don't want to tell people. We want to hide them. But I want to encourage you, share your scars Maybe not physically share them, but share your story. Share your scars. Allow yourself to be the living testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, my prayer, my prayer for us this morning, my prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we will not be ashamed to share our scars 
And so I want to pray that God will bring someone into your life over these next couple weeks, and you will not be able to mistake it that it's from God. And this person will come, and you will feel led to share about your scars and how God has healed you so that you can become the living scars of Jesus Christ. His testimony, His work in this world around us. May each and every one of us become ruins, become a ruins garden. May we all become a ruins garden. That in the midst of our pain, hurt, ruins, scars, God will make it beautiful. And it will be a testimony for others of what God can do, of how God can heal, of how God can make us complete how God can save us and set us free from the things that would bind us. Circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans. But God is not helpless among the ruins. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. Would you please pray with me? Most gracious God, we thank you for what you are doing in our lives. That in effect, we can become a ruins garden. Yes, we still have the scars. Yes, we still have the marks of pain and the marks of hurt but we also realize that we have been made beautiful. That you have taken those ruins, you have taken those hurts, you have taken those plain pains, and you have made them complete with the beauty of your Son. And just as Jesus refused to hide the scars, may we not be ashamed of the way you've worked in our lives so that we can say, yeah, we've got the scars, but they are signs of healing. They are signs of life. They are signs of hope. And my prayer, oh God, for each and every one of us in this room, that you will unmistakably send someone our way whom we can share our scars and our victory with to minister to them to show them your love. May we be open to that, O oh God. May we become a ruins garden, a sign of hope and beauty. God, we thank you for your amazing grace, and for the work that you are doing in each of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. If you're able, would you please stand with me as we join together in our closing song.